Hello, everyone. Welcome to our new episode. I'm Aran, an educator of philosophy in uh, Austin, Texas. I am here with my great friend, Tren. Hello, Tren. Hi, everybody. This is Tren, your friend. And uh, I'm a uh, historian of early medieval Europe and the later medieval China. And uh, usually I'm based in Austin, Texas, just like Aran does. But uh, for the fall of 2023, I'm actually a uh, nomad in Europe. So right now I'm in Rome. Okay, good to be with you. Good to be uh, with you too. So before starting talking, uh, start talking about what we are going to talk about today and probably for many episodes uh, ahead of us, um, uh, there are some some general points that we would want to mention, and we need to begin with um, the feedbacks that we received uh, from you guys um, for our for the episodes that we have already published. And first of all, we are genuinely grateful to those feedbacks we know that these episodes are long and everyone that we sent these episodes to very uh, busy people so the the fact that you took the time that uh, to listen to it and actually give us a feedback that was more than a thumbs up or thumbs down uh, it it means a lot and we are going to incorporate all of those um, ideas uh, in one way or another in how we organize our episodes from now on uh, in length of the episodes and how we um, organize each episode within itself in terms of kind of creating a more uh, space for dialogue to um, and with our uh, listeners. Um, so uh, very grateful and we're always ready to hear more based on what you hear in these episodes. So even if, if this is your first episode, um, feel free to uh, give us feedback. We would love to hear it and this project for uh, both of us is not just a casual random thing that we, you know, uh, we just do for, you know, lack of do, having anything else to do, but it's essential for us. So uh, getting better at doing this is something that we um, really um, um, aspire to do. Absolutely. Um, I just want to second that. And um, so we mentioned in our perhaps at um, Manifesto, the first uh, episode zero, like uh, for Zuhu is the platform of a conversation. So it's not a unilateral output from uh, Aron and me. It's like gathering feedback that I have your ideas that are reacted or echoed in this platform is like a very important way to keep the conversation going. And hopefully, as we mentioned, we will have a more direct, explicit way to have your voice incorporated through um, interviews, dialogues, or one with another so stay tuned exactly yes so with that we can enter our the new phase of this podcast and the book that we're going to talk about so the book that we are going to talk about is the opening of Hegel's logic by Stephen Holgate and Stephen Holgate is a, a contemporary philosopher based in Warwick he's still alive and working and there is something important about this book and how we should understand uh, what what it is. Mm-hmm. And um, the point of it is that although it sounds like it's just like a commentary on Hegel's logic, it is important to uh, know that within that book, parts of Hegel's logic is actually translated by Holgate. So we are not only looking at Holgate's commentary, but we are reading the text itself. And this is probably just the beginning of us reading the text itself. And Hegel, uh, Holgate's commentary is insightful and in some cases controversial. And I know that there are a, a lot of conflicting points between him and some other uh, readers of Hegel's logic. We are, we, we engage with Holgate, but our main goal is to deal with Hegel's logic. That's what we are um, trying to do, and Holgate is uh, helping us doing that. So uh, as this unfolds, we are going to use different sources that Holgate refers to and different interpretations that he has, but the re- there, always there is a return. This is not an assessment of Holgate's commentary on Hegel's logic. Mm-hmm. This is us dealing with Hegel's logic with the help of people like Holgate. And you know, later on, we will have um, other figures that will help us 
deal with this uh, complicated text, but the goal remains the same. Yes, I think that um, contextualization is very helpful, but perhaps we can tell us listeners a little bit more. How do we get to this book? The first way, how do we get to um, Hegel's um, Science of Logic? It's it's not the most beloved the textbook among the philosophy educators, like even for Hegel's sort of work. And Hegel is not necessarily the most beloved philosophers. So like... Uh, you're the philosopher guide of this uh, duet. So so tell us more. How do we get there? And how did this um, project of Hegel's connect with our project of Zuhar? Maybe. Yeah, I think there are many ways that we can get to that answer or many layers to that answer. And I think it's very important. One straightforward way of thinking about this is to think about what we discussed last time immediately, like the, the last few episodes. Uh, Hegel Contra Soci Sociology by um, Gillian Rose. And basically, if you haven't listened to those episodes, uh, Rose's main idea is that post-Hegelian thinking, and not just philosophy, I emphasize I'm thinking, is logically pre-Hegelian. And that's actually a sentence that Holgate mentions in the book. Um, and it's also important to notice that both Holgate and Rose uh, were at University of Warwick. So there is there might be some intellectual continuity there. But that's actually a sense that that's quote is from Holgate that pre uh, post Hegelian philosophy is logically pre Hegelian. I think Rose thinks of this as in more broad terms that post Hegelian thinking is pre Hegelian logically pre-Hegelian, which means it is at best Kantian, right? Probably at worst Humean, but that's a different, uh, <laughs> that, that's a different story. Uh, but what Rose is saying is that, first of all, like when we get to politically engaged philosophy of late 19th century and 20th century, which in a lot of ways gets related to Marx, and in a lot of ways, Marx is thought to be like the you know child of Hegel. Mm -hmm. A lot of people read Hegel only to read Marx. Like I, that's mm. something that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons that Hegel survived is that because yeah. is because of that kind of a apparent connection between the two. But one of the main things that someone like Rose claims is that Marx is not logically Hegelian in the way that Marx has not understood what Hegel's critique of uh, Kant, for instance, actually means. And because of that, Marx will fall into the, logically Marx falls into the new Kantian um, space of thinking. And that's not just about Marx, it's about the science of sociology, and this could be expanded. So there is a very bold claim by Rose that we try to delve into and see if uh, it makes, makes sense in those episodes, which is just to say that now our thinking as 21st century thinkers, even if we are not directly thinking, we are logically living in a Kantian space. And that Kantian space has a flaws. And Hegel is the person that may be the only person who really take those flaws seriously and engages with them and tries to get out of them, mm -hmm. right? Now, we do not have any, you know, faith in a very, like if, we're, if Hegel's critique of Kant or Hegel's alternative to Kant doesn't work, then it doesn't work, that's fine. We are not trying to just be like orthodox Hegelians, but it's one of those places that we have come to this conclusion that Hegel's failure is the stepping stone for the next move. Mm -hmm. Hey, ignoring Hegel is to go back to what was happening before, like not understanding the main the structural flaws that exist in some of the Kant. So that's um, that's how it gets connected immediately to um, right. the, the the last um, conversation that we had. Yes, and uh, listeners, if you are 
uh, terrified about the abstract return so far, but so far deploying, don't worry. We will substantiate what we mean exactly by um, count uh, flaws but gradually in the upcoming um, episode. Here's so just like a um, promontory into the whole landscape to, to contextualize ourselves. So maybe, Aram, tell us more about logic. You use the term a lot. So like, what do we mean by logic and what does, say, perhaps the Hegel mean in this project of logic, or science of logic? Yeah, actually, I, yeah, I, I think it's important that the, the complete name of the book is Science of Logic. There are a couple of things that I think is fascinating about just even like the name of this book. And we, when we get to the text ex- itself now in, in the next maybe two or three episodes, we are talking about like what the hell is going on, right? We are just even, we're not engaging with the text directly. But Yet. Yes, yeah, we will, we will, that will come. But one of the things is that, okay, if someone talks about like logic, right? And logic is something that is actually offered as an undergraduate course in the philosophy departments. Mm-hmm. And sometimes as a substitute to some math requirements, which is interesting. Those classes, which I have taken, uh, uh, a formal logic class, the essence of those classes is about some abstract rules of inference, right? Or like some sort of formal contradictions that exist in in, in formalized version of judgments and statements. And there could be like, you know, some other aspects about maybe some level of critical thinking maybe incorporated mm-hmm. in those courses rarely, but that is it's it's very very formalized and very much mathematical in a way right. um and logic is definitely in that sense is not it has nothing to do with ontology like it is not about like existence it's not about what is the nature of reality really uh it's more about this kind of like laws of uh, this space of inference whether this is a valid inference or not, whether this mm. this makes sense formally based on the premises. And that is definitely not Hegel's logic. Like when we open the book, we like page two, we, we should be sure that this is not what he is doing. And what he is doing is going to be very important and we're going to get to that in a second. But I want to say just a little bit about like the status of Hegel's logic, right? right like in right. our times or in yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. this publication. So like there are elements of the uh, the logic that was actually incorporated by Marx and Engels. Hmm. And they, they took the te- text very seriously in right. their own way that hopefully that later on, um, we are going to see like how how they did it and why that's a problematic way of dealing with the text. But so it was immediately, you know, uh, received attention, right. even like the people like Lenin, from what I remember, has some notes on Hegel's logic. Mm. So like it, it, people who like the revolution, the communist revolutionaries took Hegel's logic very seriously, the way that they took it seriously is going to be something interesting to look at, like in what sense they took it seriously, what they wanted to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But in the Anglo-American territory, the the, the anti-communist territory, in in a way, um, the the faith of Hegel's logic is just um, fascinating. It's almost universally not taught like i in the first of all like hegel is definitely like a minority of uh, philosophy departments in the u.s in the first place and and, uh, sometimes you know some other departments in humanities and social sciences are more um, you know conducive like they they are more interested in exploring hegel's ideas but maybe when they think about hegel the other disciplines they think about hegel you know aesthetics yeah right Right, like religion, religion. Yeah. yeah, or religion, like th- those types of texts. But um, when it is a philosophy department, 
Hegel is taught and it's more taught now than like, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, but almost always it's either phenomenology of spirit or the elements of philosophy of right. Mm. Almost always. And uh, so Hegel's logic is not Important. like, even in, mm. yeah, it's just not even dealt with. Right. I know that the uh, Holgate actually teaches um, Hegel's logic um, at Warwick. And it might be one of the very few places. Uh, I think in DePaul University in uh, Chicago also, uh, Hegel's uh, courses on and Hegel's logic are sometimes offered by Kevin Thompson. Maybe Robert Pippin at the University of Chicago has a lot. Uh, you know, has um, offered some courses uh, throughout the years. But definitely, it's not a recurring study mm. of the text at mm. all. Mm. It's not at all and and there even amongst people who take Hegel seriously, right. like even when Hegel is taken seriously, when he, when he's, he, people engage with it, uh, logic is kind of like ignored, right? Or not? Yeah, it's just not approached. Other than the the whole thing that I think Holgate rightfully mentions in, in the opening of Hegel's logic, and that you know when people engage with Hegel, a lot of times what it happens is that you know read the introduction to logic right read the preface mm. to um, logic of uh, spirit and mm. no one gets into the actual arguments that he makes right in the book i mean of course people do but it's it's rare so hegel's logic number one has nothing to do with logic in the way that we usually understand the word in our times number two hegel's logic whatever it is is not presented, is not even, you know, entertained as a possibility of just something valuable. Um, right. And what we are going to do in this episode and next episode, other than introducing you to kind of like what is going on here, is to show you like what, why engaging with this matter? Right. Like, mm -hmm. Because we are not, and I think it's important to mention this, I mean, it is clear that the fact that this podcast, um, you know, I, I have studied philosophy, Trent has studied history, and that should tell you something about the nature of discussions. That is just, we're not technicians of, you know, philosophy or any other kind of like a, a theoretical realm of that kind that, you know, we are not thinking of engaging with Hegel's logic because we have, we are, from, we've already belonged to this club of Hegelians, and you. This only matters to you if you're a Hegelian already. Then you can join in. If we are successful in introducing you to the essence of the book, I think we are confident that you don't need to be a Hegelian to at least be fascinated by what Hegel was trying to do. And if that fascination is a little bit more towards curiosity, accepting it as an invitation for dealing with the text. So this is very important because I think as we are gonna expound what Hegel is saying about logic itself, Hegel definitely thinks that's the case. It is as absurd to think of Hegel's logic as like something that only become, belongs to the technicians of right. Hegel or like Hegel's own like little thing. Like it's just, he thought this is just, mm. like, you know, his personal philosophy in life, right? It is as absurd as thinking that way it is saying that Darwin's book was, it was just like, yeah, he just like, you know, wrote something for his own, you know, fun. And he just, you know, if you're a Darwinian, you can go read it. But if you're not a Darwinian, you were already, it's just absurdity uh, to think about Hegel's project. And Hegel would have been furious if he knew that only, quote unquote, Hegelians read his book. Hegel specialists, that, that, yeah. That term does not mean anything. Right. Hegel might be wrong, just like Darwin may be wrong. But you don't read Darwin as a Darwinian. If you start reading Darwin as a Darwinian, you have lost the point. You have missed the point of what he's talking about. 
And I think the same thing goes with Hegel. Read Hegel, find its fundamental flaws, and move on. And you have respected Hegel's project, which is the important thing that we are going to do. So that's just like off the bat that it's we are not dealing with this text as quote unquote Hegelians. And you don't need to be a Hegelian. And in fact, you don't even need to know anything about Hegel at all because of the nature of the project. Indeed, indeed. Yes, I. Um, thanks a lot for that. Um, I. What motivated me as a, like a cultural historian to know more about Hegel is um, a profound dissatisfaction about the wildly uh, desperate that um, field of, I have to engage with, and then it seems to me in the humanities or human science or social science that I'm like, exposed to each different subset have a unacknowledged, say, ground assumption or ground um, concepts that are never examined. We already discussed about that a little bit in the um, Rose that are Hegel contra sociology episodes. Um, sociologists would assume there is a category called a society and anthropologists would, um, a cultural anthropologists would assume there is a, something called a culture out there and then they one borrowing their evidence or their data or their theories and, and to form a patchwork to present, let's say, a, a historical case, sometimes I'm just not very convinced or I'm sus uh, suspicious that they probably do not share the same world of views. They do not share the ground category, the ground assumptions about how, say, uh, individual expression or existence connected with another's or like with the collective in general and ever since um the hyper specialization of high um high education such questioning and inquiry into how compatible how cross uh, fertilizing um such a juxtaposition um, is is not happening yet instead we have certain blind faith in the so-called interdisciplinary research as long as you read text or like uh, engage with research from a different view you are contributing to something but are we really are we not just like uh, mission things uh, with completely different assumptions together i think for me hegel is really attractive because he is the only my, my ignorance, but I really try to, to diversify my diet, but he's the only like item on the menu that is available who at least proposed to take this challenge, challenge seriously to see how do we get to those like ground level categories and to what extent such categories are externally superimposed, or maybe come from our ideological conviction, historical position or culture we're born into, or to what extent certain categories are kind of uh, more natural or universal, could be derived from the pure act of thinking. So as you mentioned, he definitely did not, Hegel definitely did not write this book, Science and Logic, for some technical experts or specialists of his texts you know, who will write a commentary, a commentary and palm commentary and compare them. Now he, I think, if he had only um, a group in mind, that group would be thinkers, think people who care about human thinking, who 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 are convinced that human thinking is a powerful and like connects with human dignity, perhaps, and connects with the um, it's the best way to realize the human potential, whatever. So whoever thinks and conscious of their own thinking and want to perhaps refine or be more critical of their thinking would benefit a lot from reading this really challenging book. So that's why uh, me as a complete outsider feel the absolute need to engage with his work. So how about you? Like, do you want something to add? To yeah, that? I think that's actually a very good way to kind of enter into like the, uh, the, uh, the and for those of you who are uh, looking at your screen, now you can see this slide on uh, the project of logic. I think what Trent mentioned is actually going to give us a better idea of what Hegel's project in logic is actually is. So one way to think about it, there are many ways to think about it. And as we discussed, like different, think of this as different pieces of puzzle. 
that you don't need to immediately understand, uh, have the, the whole picture, but each piece will contribute to the, to, the, and to the main idea there. One of the ways that you can think about partial of logic is to think of it as a reconsideration of uh, what basic concepts are. What does that mean? That means that, and that's the first quote of the um, this slide, which is from Science of Logic, that basically Hegel is telling us that categories, these basic concepts, are the types of concepts that are that are hidden, concealed in any expression we use in language, right? So when we talk, talk about categories in this sense, when we think about basic concepts, what are we thinking about? If we're thinking about concepts like being, nothing, something, other, identity, difference, cause. Like these are the types of concepts that we do not, when we are talking, we are not immediately talking about these concepts. Neither, we, neither are we aware always that oh this is what i think what something means right this is what i think nothing means um but they are there we can think about them as some you know basic presuppositions that make the entirety of the language um, communicable and understandable about what these concepts um actually mean so one of the ways to look at Hegel's science of logic is a massive, comprehensive, and borderline insane reconsideration of the meaning of these categories that are with us in this kind of an invisible way. Um, that, but they, their, their invisible presence determines the rest of our not only thoughts, but actions. It is very much connected to. Our, the way that we think, the way we act, is very much connected to how we think about concepts in general, what concepts are, and the specific concepts such as being or nothing or identity or difference or in more concrete ways, individuality, universality, particularity, things of that nature. What our thinking is always these categories are always contained in it mm. and we don't explicate that but it is like someone who has a faith in a religion and you know they may not look at it in any sort of critical way or even be aware of it they just think this is it this is the story of the world this is the story of cosmos but that cosmic story believing that cosmic story is setting the tone for everything else like it doesn't need to present itself in icons or like explicit affirmation of the cosmic story at every interaction, but mm -hmm. every interaction carries that cosmic story with it. And I think that's how Hegel thinks about these basic concepts, that these basic concepts do not need to be explicated to be influential. They're already influential. Now, Hegel's project would be um, a directed at reconsideration of these concepts. Now, two minimal points here that are important, minimal in terms of the length of that I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk, but it's, they're very important. One is that there is a something about a continuity that happens in this very strange period in the uh, German philosophy of um, 18th and 19th century in this kind of a critical project of really delving into these kind of categories of thought and categories in general. And we see that in Kant, we see that in Fichte, and as you see in the, um, uh, on the slide, uh, Holgate mentions this, that you know uh, Hegel, I'm quoting, completes the task he believes is bequeathed to him by Kant and Fichte to derive the basic categories of thought from the very nature of thought itself. 
So the enigmatic part of like what, what it means to derive this from the very nature of thought itself that we might look at it with suspicion, we talk about that, like what that means. But I, I want to add that, that there is this um, idea that this is not an empirical inquiry in the usual sense. And there is a reason why it's not mm -hmm. the empirical inquiry. And we will get to that later on. The second point, and then I will rest my case, is that it is important to understand that in this reconsideration of these basic concepts, it's not only the concepts that are reconsidered, but our concept of a concept is also reconsidered. Right. In other words, like it's not just like now we have a new quote unquote theory about being, but it's about also thinking what even a concept is just as an option, just to think it would like give you an idea. Right. Um, a concept could be just like an empty name, right? It could be an empirical concept that, you know, we could have called this thing a chair or um, a t we could have, we could all call it a table or mm -hmm. tish. Like it just, it, it doesn't matter. That's just like a placeholder for some empirical thing that we can refer to. And that's it. You know, that's one way to think about concepts. You can right. think about concepts in Platonic way that concepts are actually like pointers to some very, re actually the very reality is in the concepts mm -hmm. in a Platonic way, right? And I'm not endorsing either of those viewpoints. I'm just saying that that is part of that quote unquote cosmic story that I was mentioning, right? It's, it's not just about what I think being means. It's about what I think being as a concept is. And that's an ontological status of it. Because we can think about this, oh, these concepts are all just fictions. They're never penetrating reality itself. Sure. That's one way to think about concepts. Another way is that, oh, some concepts do not penetrate reality. But these concepts penetrate, penetrate reality. These concepts are not mere concepts. They are the language of the universe itself. The universe is talking with those concepts. That's another way to think about concepts. And again, it's not an endorsement of any of these viewpoints. It's just like bringing to your consciousness that when you think about concepts, you're also thinking about, or when you have a whole, when you hold a view on what a concept means, you're also holding a view on what that concept is or what concepts are. And that is also part of Hegel's project. Maybe in some sense, even the more important part of this project that is not just about a reconsideration of the concepts without touching the question about what concepts are, but actually using that reconsideration to reconsider what concepts are. And these two are going to interact. But in this sense, when we think about Hegel's science of logic, we could think about it as just ontology of concepts too, and ontology in general as a result of that. Like, yeah, what is a concept? Right. Yes, that's. Um, I'm glad I put that uh, very succinct quote on because that really resonates deeply in my heart when I was reading and I was super agitated, excited because of the, he is Hegel is basically with this science of logic um, problematizing or disturbing a very important boundary in my worldview that is the boundary between ontology that is our conceptualization of being whatever and epistemology that is our thinking about thinking which i think has a very neat parallel in applied logic or the way how human science or sociology is conducted that you can have a very you, we do observe different theorists that the, um, centralize the human society around completely different things and consider the two or multiple, mo all of them, not really uh, interdependent in any way. Let's just give two examples. Like um, with being, we can have perhaps a material and with a uh, small knowledge, we have like knowledge and you can have people more like uh, Marx who could consider like uh, capitalism is primarily how material production 
and redistribution is a structured and whatever religion, whatever comes from it is just a, a, a secondary derivation. What really matters is how material is produced and like structures the society. But on the other hand, you can have people like Weber who says, well, actually you need a certain type of value conviction rationale, like a Protestant work ethic to make a capitalism even like a possible. So before material, there's like, knowledge or at least at the same time they mutually enforce each other but at the, this kind of debate somehow presupposes and reiterates the uh distinction between the two and hegel's project to another hand is offering a complete alternative and at a very deep radical level um alternative to that is such a um presumption of distinction perhaps that is misleading at the first place so yes that's uh, what i observed so perhaps um, any person who is interested in interpreting social phenomena would benefit a lot from the science of logic in deriving from his project certain valuable tools and uh, traits of the thought to, to reconsider to what extent their assumptions in the discipline or whatever is really valid or grounded, or sometimes it was just assumed. And how are we going to deal with the uh, bounder, but the borders or boundaries um, uh, presupposed in our discipline? Yes. Yes, that's that's very important. And I think the point that you mentioned about the distinction between epistemology and ontology and the relationship between the two is also significant in another way. And it's in the way that the whole thing about the post-Hegelian philosophy is logically pre-Hegelian. And what is this logically pre-Hegelian? And in what sense Hegel's logic um, is going to be in uh, direct contrast with this? Now, I think we could introduce this uh, in this episode, uh, at the point that I'm going to mention in um, the relation between Hegel uh, and Descartes and Kant. We could introduce this, then we probably should, you know, um, uh, end this episode and continue that discussion in our next episode. So I would just spend some time introducing a basic structure of how Hegel's science of logic is related, but also very different from Descartes and Kant. And that relationship is very important, I think. And it's very important, not just because of a like, uh, you know, historian of philosophy, but in, in terms of the in, this intellectual relevance. Right. Because, okay, let's say we have set our task to be the reconsideration of concepts. Cool. Right. That's great. Um, and we have also, you know, set this task that we are, we want to even reconsider what concepts are, right? right. Which in one way or another is exactly what Descartes and Kant also want to do, right? This type of a modern enlightenment type of criticism of just going back and kind of reconsidering very basic things is the spirit of it is, uh, is present here. And there are elements in both Descartes and Kant that carry over to Hegel's project, but their differences are going to be significant. Okay, so just for a very short summary of what these two people do, and I think we can talk about what Hegel reacts to this right. um, in the next um, episode. Um, so Descartes is trying to do a comprehensive criticism, right? And the way that he wants to do the comp comprehensive criticism is his question, Descartes' question, is about certainty. Right. What can I be certain of? And uh, if anything is kind of uh, dubitable, then it seems like there, there is no certainty at sight. So Descartes project for this kind of reconsideration of the order of the universe, more like an ontological project, uh -huh. is to find something that he can be absolutely certain of. And from that deriving the rest, right? So the beginning for Descartes, this idea of beginning is going to be very important in Hegel. The beginning for Descartes 
must be a firm foundation, right? Mm -hmm. Must be the build, like the building block. It's going to be that. We're going right. to build the house. The metaphor, the Cartesian metaphor would be that, okay, we have this, you know, house. We, this house needs a good foundation. Mm -hmm. We need to go and find something that offers that foundation. And what is offering that foundation? Something that I can be certain of. And then we can build the building. The beginning as a firm foundation. Right. Which is important when we get to Hegel, because that is not at all what Hegel thinks of a beginning, right? So Descartes is concerned about certainty. Now, what is Kant? Uh, what is Kant's concern? Kant is, in a different way, interested in certainty in a way that he describes it in terms of like. How could I know that these, first of all, what are these categories of, the, of thinking, right? What are these all, all sorts of weird things that we have, like cause and effect? Like, you know, it, 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 what, what is this? What is going on here? Um, what kind of concepts are these? If not, they're not empirical. Because if we, for instance, think about the concept of cause as an empirical concept, as something that we see and name, right, like a chair, then we are in, tied with Hume's problem, right? Because then the more you look, the, the less you find any quote unquote thing called cause. So then it becomes like a fictitious concept that you just ab absolutely randomly just came up with uh, and it doesn't have any sort of validity to it. So what Kant is doing and causality is just one way to think about what like more directly what he's um, doing. Kant is saying that, look, let's reconsider what type of a concept something like causality is. And when we do that, we can understand its validity or limited validity um, or limited contribution to an objective thinking um, right. about, uh, about the world. So what Kant is doing is that there is that critical project of reconsidering these concepts. Um, and uh, there is also a logical, quote unquote, logical uh, approach in Kant as well, which is, which he calls transcendental logic of asking for the necessary conditions for different things, necessary condition for experience. And his answer would be for causality, for instance, that employing the concept of causality is a necessary condition for experience. We cannot experience the world in the first place unless we have already employed the, the concept of causality. So that the concept of causality is not something that we find in experience, it's something that makes experience possible, right? So that's just like one way to approach what Kant is doing. But what is important is that in both Kant and Descartes, despite all the critical force, there are some rather fixed points mm -hmm. that happen, that is a fixed point that exists. And one of the main points of this is a, a fixation on relation. relation. They're both thinking about a relation, right? Like if you think about Descartes, Descartes, both starts with a relation and ends with a relation in the first two meditations, right? In the sense that when you think about certainty, when your concern is certainty, you have already assumed a distinction between subject and object. Now you, want, you wonder whether you can be any certain about anything about this existing world. Like you already have assume that there is a distinction between the two. Now you wonder about this relationship. Is, is there like solid ground to accept that this relationship is sound, meaningful, rational? It, is it actually fictitious, illusionary, whatever? The concern is the relationship. That's one thing. So in both Kant and Descartes, there is already a distinction between that, okay, there is the there is our subjectivity and there is something that is as an object 
And how could we how could we be sure? How could we be sure that our concepts match with the world? Case of Kant. How could we be sure that we are not just hallucinating all the time? Right? Relationship. The relation is there. And when there is a relation, there is a presupposition of distinction. No matter how that distinction is um, you know, conceptualized, there is a there is an idea beh behind there that implies that distinction. Number two, and this is about Kant, and this is um, something that we are going to talk about a little bit more at the beginning of next um, episode, is about the relationship between, it's not only about the relationship between the subject and uh, object, but mm -hmm. thinking of uh, this other other something that is other than the subject as things as objects right in the sense that the the distinction not only happens or the distinction is not only presupposed between subject and object object as the whole world of object but the world is already accepted as uh, you know, a compilation of many different differentiated objects, right? right? Um, he, Kant keeps talking about objects of experience, mm. right? And um, instead of something more general, which right. is going to be something that Hegel is going to talk about. But I think with this, like, and with the slide that you are seeing, uh, we can stop here. And this slide is about Hegel's criticism of uh, right. Descartes and Kant. We talk about that more, and we start the next episode with that. So let me go back to trend and yeah. final thoughts to this stage. But we haven't yet said what Hegel finds problematic here. You have you see the slide, but we're going to talk about this slide next time in more details. Yes. So based on which were like a long but a very helpful summary of the card and the content and the Hegel's relation with the two is um Hegel tried to inherit that on one hand their self-criticism, that a radical criticism, like um, not receiving anything for granted. And on the other hand, tried to sort of even go one step uh, further than the two like uh, he's making fuss that about a certain fixed point in their system so let's see in perhaps the next episode of what that would naturally lead hegel and us to and uh perhaps that will help us a bit understand why hegel's the science of logic is uh problematic and it's not problematic it's uh not easily comprehended and consequence consequently ignored for so long so, dear listeners, it's been great to reconvene you with you again, and stay tuned. We're going to dive into Hegel's Science of Logic in our next episode. Back to you, Aaron. Thank you. Ciao, ciao.